It is, okay. Why do US trade more with the Netherlands and Belgium compared to the rest of the EU? Yeah, they have two big ports, Rotterdam in the Netherlands and in Belgium. Antwerp. Antwerp. Yeah. So that's a specific reason why they do trade more with the Netherlands and Belgium. They are simply linked closer to it. So that is one of the exceptions or the anomalies. So if you want to know why countries trade, you have to remember three things. Like I remember Christine, Stina, and Laura. <laughs> geography, because the distance is geography. Transport, because you have to overcome distance. And three, culture. Why do Japan? import a lot of fish from Norway. It's not culture, it's not geography, it's not distance, it's simply business. So <laughs> we call it an anomaly because they could have imported them from China or nearby. Why from Norway? It's simply it's uh, probably. Uh, I think if you ask me, it's we both kill whales. So we met some uh, in some party and nobody liked us. And then we decided, okay, you have fish, we have fish, you eat fish, we eat fish, you kill whales, we kill whales. Okay, <laughs> let's start to <laughs> import fish from each other. I think it was as easy as that. It's an anomaly. It's not explained by geography, distance, or culture. It's simply because of special reasons. And Lauren will know why. Do any of you have fish for dinner, uh, let's say, had last week or plan to have this week? You do? Okay. Do you know that this has been produced in China? I didn't check the package. Okay. <laughs> so what we actually do is we fish it in Norway. We transport it to China and takes it back to Norway to eat it. Why don't we take it directly to the consumers? It's simply because transport is cheaper and cheaper. Guess who explained this first time? One of the famed relatives of Laurent, a French guy called Gilles Dupy. He wrote about it in 1845 and explained, why do we change our production pattern if con transport is getting cheaper? And this is partly what Kuhlman is trying to explain. Transport is a very important explanation to trade. And the cheaper the transport is, the more trade you can see. But none of you read Norwegian newspapers. So we did not export Joshua French to Congo to get diamonds. If you wonder, what are they doing in Congo? That has nothing to do with Norwegian trade. Although there are some lawyers in Norway that make money of it, this is not part of trade theory. So if you wonder if this can be explained by Krugman's trade theory model, no, there is a different explanation to it. Okay? So we import more from countries where we have personal contacts. That doesn't mean that the Norwegian Minister of Trade has a friend in Japan, and that's why they import fish from Norway. But since there are, let's say, French now living in the southern part of the world, there are some links between France and the US that can generate trade. So that is what he's saying. Because of personal contacts, there are more trade between countries. Do you know what a trade agreement is? Since we are now on television, what is NAFTA? 
Yes? Trade agreements between Canada, US, and uh, Mexico. Yeah, so we call it the North Atlantic Free Trade Agreement. Was this the first NAFTA? What was the first one? It was a free trade agreement between an N and an A. No. It's further away than you think. Yeah. Or even further away. It's Australia and New Zealand, what we call the Oceania. The first free trade agreement between an N and an A was New Zealand with Australia. Why did they have a free trade agreement? They are neighbors. There are a lot of import and export. So why shouldn't they have a free trade agreement to make trade, let's say, more uh, of trade? Because of protectionism? Yeah, they could protect them, uh, their markets from, let's say, Asia and uh, US and whatever. But they form a free trade area so they could trade with each other at a low, let's say, lower cost. Close business. OK, was there a European free trade agreement? And was Germany a member? First question, yes or no, was it? It was, OK. Why wasn't Germany? It Why wasn't France? Why wasn't Netherlands? What was the alternative? The European Economic Community, which we now call EU. Who was member of EU from the start? <coughs> Germany, <coughs> France, three, yeah. Netherlands, Belgium, and a big state in between, Luxembourg. Benelux, France, Italy, and Western Germany. So that was free trade arrangements. So there has been free trade arrangement for a very long period. Who was member of the European, or EFTA? Was Yes, Norway, <laughs> not Brazil, <laughs> Norway. Three of them are members of EU now, maybe even f more. Sweden, Denmark, UK. I think Ireland might have been. I'm not sure. The Irish are special, so I'm not sure of that. But there was a European free trade agreement simply because they wanted more trade. And they were neighbors. So that's the back. So free trade agreement has made it easier to trade. But if you look at the Brazilians, what are their free trade agreement call. Mercosur. Mercosur, which means trade in the south. So much Brazilian I know. So I've learned it from Google. <laughs> I got it transferred. So Mercosur simply means trade in the south. Yeah. Not southern Norway, but southern America. Yeah. Okay? <coughs> so there are a lot of free trade agreements between countries try to, well, let's say, improve the conditions uh, for trade. So then the question is, have you seen table 2-3? Would you like to see it? Then you have to open your textbook and look up page 48. No, that is figure. Do you see the difference between a figure and a table? That is the table. OK. So those of you who had afford to buy the textbook, as you see, very few Norwegians can afford it. They one day might get one. But the idea there is simply they specialize. And there are a growing trade with specialized goods that explain, uh, let's say, the development of trade. So we need specialized good.
Do you know what it is? It looks like this. It can be used like that one. So there are a lot of goods that are, let's say, uh, generated by special technology. And therefore, there are more and more of it. Okay. Uh, so when the Brazilian came over, they did not sail like Norwegian did when they sell the first fish to Brazil a long time ago. They flew. That is a specialized good. And it is very often produced in very few countries. So the rest of the world have to buy it. So part of trade is simply explained by few countries producing it, a lot of countries using it. How do we get hands of them? We can do like they do in southern Italy. We can steal it. But most of it has to be bought. So therefore, we trade it. I hope you are not from me Napoli. No. <laughs> okay. There is one in Brazil, a different name. There is one in China, in Japan. So they're all over. But what explains, or is explained by Table 8, is simply we specialize the production. It's a limited producing countries. But since all of us are using it, we have to import all of it. So how many iPhones do you think we produce in Norway? Zero. Zero. How many do we buy? A lot. A lot. I, I would assume that at least two per Norwegian. But I think that is ex exaggerating a little bit. But at least one. So these comes from few countries. We have to buy them, and we call it import. So that is explained by table two, three. More and more of trade is simply something they produce in a very few or limited countries. OK, so what can France offer? High-speed trains <laughs> and aircrafts. Aircrafts, too. Isn't that correct, Warren? Yeah. So if you want to fly an Airbus, Try to buy it in Switzerland or even in the Netherlands. You have to go to France to get them. It's a specialized product. OK? So if you wake up one day and miss your iPhone and look for your iPad, the reason why it's stolen is somebody that couldn't afford to buy it. But he's not from Congo. He is not uh, buying it in an open market. But most of it has to be bought. And it's produced in only a few countries, so we specialize. OK. <laughs> but cafe latte is not a Brazilian innovation, is it? But there is a chain selling coffee, uh, something Negredo or something. I think has a Brazilian name. But this is a product that you can produce in more than Brazil. You can get African coffee. I'm not sure if you can eat Asian coffee. No, I think they produce tea. So if you want to drink tea, go to Asia. If you want to drink coffee, Brazil or Africa. Yeah. Why don't they produce coffee on Iceland when they sometimes produce bananas? Or why do they produce bananas in Iceland? It's an anomaly. And it's explained by only one thing. They have too cheap energy. Do you know why they produce it or how they produce it? They drill a hole down to the hot center. Water. It's hot water. So they take it up, <coughs> extract the, the energy of it, let it down again. It boils by itself, comes up again, goes up and down and up and down. Any day, any time of the hour, they can produce energy because the earth boils it for you. They need nothing to heat it up. And that's the cheapest place on earth where you can get energy. OK? Uh, do any of you plan to buy not an electrical car, but a hydrogen-driven car? They do it on Iceland. Because it's so cheap, you can put hydrogen on Iceland. Very cheap. So if you want Citroën to have a hydrogen driven system go to Iceland. So some of this is, let's say, specialities, anomalies, but most of it is 
easy to explain with the Ricardian model. Okay? But this is specialization of production. It's a huge or large scale or economy of scale production. If I had asked you before you saw figure two five, which of these would you think was the biggest part of trade in a country? And the answer is not agriculture. Less and less of what we import and export is agriculture. More and more of it is services or uh, what we call manufacturers. So we are very fond of, Africa, no, of Brazilian coffee, but it means less and less for the Norwegian economy because it's got a smaller and smaller part of it. biggest change in trade the last 25, 30 years has been the expanding, developing countries' economies. And then we are back, I'm afraid, Arthur, to Brazil. I think we call them Brasic, don't we? Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Yeah. It was a very good trial. <laughs> we could send them back to the area, but I think uh, the Greek would oppose it a little bit. Oh, no, I, yeah. I didn't think okay. No, so the growing economies are Brazil, South Africa, India, mm -hmm. China, and Russia, which we would have called developing countries. But we can sooner or later say are developed countries. The biggest economies uh, in the world are US and no China. China surpassed India, no, uh, Japan last year. So maybe Brazil one day will be number three, but let's, let's wait and see. But then uh, the range, uh, or the, uh, the, uh, the biggest will be China, then it will be India, maybe Brazil, and then US. But that is a little bit ahead of us now. Yeah. But the biggest economies are, in fact, oh, the biggest growth in economies are in what we call developing countries. Okay? Have you heard about Singapore, South Korea, Malaysia? Do you know what we <coughs> called them 10 years ago? Why well, do you think this is the day for the end? This is not a French guy in a French movie. Then it would have been with a K, wouldn't it be? Nick, because he's a migrant coming to Paris and live, let's say, the special life of an American in, in Paris. What is Nick? Newly yes, newly industrialized countries. Singapore, Malaysia, South Korea. They had the same growth as they have in India and China now. But I'm afraid it's a limit to growth both in China, India, Brazil, and countries like this. But that will be learned if you read Krugman pretty close. So Laurent will tell you when he has found it in the textbook. But these are the growing economies. Now we call them developing countries and Brasic is one of them. OK. Do you know what it means to outsource? Yeah. To put the service from my own factory uh, to another land where I can do the same service for yeah, less money. Yes. Very often, the American call is offshoring. But then the Norwegian get a little bit confused. Because what is offshoring in Norway? It's simply drilling for oil and gas I on the continental shelf. And that is different from outsourcing. But offshoring and outsourcing simply means we do not produce it here, we send it abroad, and then take it back because it's cheaper. Now we have something called backsourcing. 
And that is not tourism in the outsourcing area. What is backsourcing? Yeah? Yeah, when we recognized that uh, for these goods, mm -hmm. uh, the transportation cost got higher. Mm -hmm. And uh, another fact, uh, we uh, took our services to uh, another country. This country gets bigger and bigger. The, econom uh, the econo economic rises. Yeah. And they uh, want to have more money for the same service. So uh, the calculation is uh, not so good for us. So we took it back or maybe to another country uh -huh. where the prices are even low. And there is also an additional explanation. The quality that you got while outsourcing is now more than compensating doing at home at a higher price because you robotize the same production. It simply means you do not use manual work. You got perfect quality at a cheaper price. So outsourcing ends up at backsourcing when the quality could be improved by robotizing the production of it. Do you know, and now I look at the Norwegians, a company in this county that has backsourced its production. So then none of you have a cousin in Sunmara or a grandfather in Heroi or have been sailing by Ulstanvik. No. Okay. Kvarner is a Norwegian shipyard that used to outsource its production of the hull of a ship to Poland. Now they backsource it because they knew, no longer use manual work for doing it. So part of this has turned back. So not all of the trade will be outsourcing in the future. Is that a relief for so not all French workers will be, let's say, unemployed. Yeah. So that is part of the pattern that changed again. But in the period, this was a very important part of it. OK? And then comes the favorite uh, way to uh, formulate it for Krugman. It's rare. Very often you have a feeling that when you speak about outsourcing, it's a very big issue. And then Krugman takes you by the head and say, listen boy, it is rare. It's not much of it. It's only a smaller or minor part of trade. But it sounds like it's a big problem. Not to France, but to US. So there has been a debate in US Will this outsourcing, let's say, destroy or deindustrialize US? And the answer is no. It's too rare. It's too few of them. So that is <coughs> the comfort, isn't it? So don't worry. You heard the song? Be happy. <laughs> yeah. So the point is, it's a big issue in the media. It's a big debatable issue in the economy. But if you look at numbers, the answer is, it's rare. And that is one of the most important lessons you will learn when you know Krugman from one to the beginning to the end is simply look at numbers, count numbers, read statistics. It sounds like it's a big problem. The answer is, it's a very rare problem, indeed. So what about s Brazil then? Why can't we survive by outsourced American industry? The answer is, they went to China, not to Brazil. So don't worry, be happy. <coughs> so very often, questions about international economics are a big issue when it comes to debate in the newspaper. When it comes to numbers, it kills the debate. So anytime you meet somebody out, let's say, in a bar in Molde that is concerned about Norwegian international economics, just look at him and say, read Krugman, my friend. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so the conclusion to Krugman is simply this. We stick to the old rules. 
And the oldest rules are Hume, but he was not able to put it into a concrete model. So the answer is Ricardo. So look up Ricardo. He can explain why it's like this. And then I look around and see a lot of human beings in here. And all of you are, let's say, planning to change the world as soon as you finish your bachelor. Or maybe two years after, because you also want the master. But that's different. What about human resources? Could that change trade? And the answer is yes, there are human resources and human created resources that can explain trade. And maybe that is the most important. Don't worry about outsourcing. <coughs> worry about your head and your fellows in Brazil, because these are the resources that are important for production and for trade. <coughs> so here we are. Ricardo is the next. Have you ever heard the concept opportunity cost? Let's try to explain it. There are two ways that you can get access to Krugman. You can sit home at your accommodation and read and read, see nobody around you, and that is one way to get access to the curriculum. Isn't that correct? Drop all the lectures. Don't go to parties. Read and read. That is one. The opportunity cost of that is simply this, Lauren. You will never see people. You will never hear Norwegian words. You will never get at parties. You will not even see, let's say, more people sitting listening to a lecture up there that is recorded. So the opportunity cost is, what do you miss when you drop the alternative? And that is what he's trying to explain. If I can produce two goods, wine and cheese, okay? If I decide to produce cheese, then I had to drop the production of. That is a cost to me, because I lose uh, revenue or income. But it can be worth it if producing cheese will give, generate more income. So the question is always this. Should I produce cheese or wine? And the answer is yes, if the opportunity cost is less, or no, if it's higher. So either. I earn my money from wine, or from cheese, or a mix, depending on the opportunity. So you drop one to produce the other. That indicates the opportunity. OK, we'll see it before 5 o'clock. I will show you two examples of opportunity costs before 5 o'clock. Remind me of that. And I think you are Lena. Uh, the Norwegian pronunciation of that is Lena, because we have a Lena with an I. Okay? Yeah. So Lena will explain you after 5 o'clock. If you do not understand it, just ask Lena, because she got the points. And that is because she is German and speaks no <coughs> Norwegian in free time when you don't see her. Okay? There are one important thing to explain Ricardo. That is a budget constraint. Do you know what it is? You will soon realize when you are trying to buy you something in the shop and look you look down the purse and say, there is nothing in there. That is a budget constraint. There are a given amount of resources or values you can use. It's not unlimited. If you know somebody with unlimited resources, ask him to contact me. <laughs> then there will be no lecture in this course, because then we are on our way to our most happiest day in the world. Because then we can do whatever we do. We have money for anything what we do. We can do whatever we like to. And we don't like to stay in front of students on Wednesdays. It's OK. But on Fridays, it's not. So unlimited, no. There are constraints. It's reducing the po <coughs> possibility to produce something. So there is a given limit. Probably we can show it, let's say, 4.16. Is that a deal, Christine? 
416, I will show you the budget constraint. <coughs> Why don't they produce more computers in Colombia? It's because of opportunity cost. They can get more out of the resources producing something different than computers. Okay? So that is what opportunity cost is the question about. What could you get out of your resources by dropping the activity? Then we are at table 3.1, and you first time meet soul. In Norwegian, it means sun. Also? OK. What is soul? Standard of living. Simply means, what can you afford to do? And for you, standard of living means that you are not buying too much expensive Norwegian beer, <laughs> stick to free water, <laughs> don't buy the bottles, just fill them in the tap, and ask some nice Norwegian with a lot of money that, you see, I'm an incoming student, so I cannot afford this, and they will say, OK, come and have a party with me. That is what we call raising standard of living, to get more out of the resources. OK? Uh, so standard of living will raise in two ways. <coughs> you either produce more, or you earn more money for what you are producing. And that is the basic content of a Ricardo model. There are two ways to increase your income. Produce more of it, or raise the price of it. Trade raises the price of goods that you sell or export. And if you don't believe me, I will repeat it two minutes to five o'clock. Trade raises the price of the goods that you export. And Lena will repeat it to you later. Trade raises the price of the goods that you export. What happens in the country that imports is they produce more of the goods that they earn more money. But that is different. OK? Yes. Comparative advantage. We can do a little bit more. OK. Comparative advantage simply means the opportunity cost of producing that good and you barter between the two goods, in the terms of the other good, is lower. And thus, they export. That was hard to understand. But you get it over and over again, at least in the next hour. Okay? So if you stay awake, you will know it before the end of the next hour. <coughs> and then comes the first conclusion in Krugman, simply saying, Trade is beneficial if each country export the goods in, this, in which they have comparative advantage. We can also put it this way. We trade what we get more money of by exporting it. So both countries will gain by exporting this because they get more money of it because they have comparative advantage in the production. So, Portugal, which formerly was, I think, uh, the colony master of Brazil. Yeah, that's why they speak a kind of Portuguese. <coughs> but I think most Brazilians will call it Brazilian. No, okay, you call it Brazilian. Okay. Yeah. Don't you understand a little bit of Spanish, too? Yes. Okay. So if any of you speak Spanish, try it on Arturo and Gilead. Okay. So the point is, if both country export goods where they have comparative advantage, they will benefit from it. And benefit simply means they get more money out of it. And we'll show you exactly what it has of influences to inhabitants in this area. And the easiest way to explain this is you can increase your consumption.
not only the production, but also consumption in both countries. So trade increased the production. And Christine will remind you that is we speak about direct production <coughs> and indirect production. And she won't know it yet, but soon she will know what it is. Direct production means it's produced in the country. So far, so good. Produced in the country. What is then indirect production? It's production in another country that you import. So by import, you drop to produce it yourself, but you get it cheaper by import. And then you increase the possibility to consume two different goods. It influences the supply of both goods, as we will show. But if you want to know the answer and have, let's say, three minutes during the break, look up figure 3-5. So when you meet Lena out on the town, uh, in the nearest shop, she will have figure 3-5 with her to explain exactly what is meant by 3-5. 3-5 simply indicates the benefit of trade. Both countries get access to more value of, uh, uh, units of both goods. And that is beneficial to all. Was that a comfort? In case not, ask later. We have three, no, four minutes left. So most of the model is presented uh, a little bit later, but you have to know what is production possibilities. It's simply a curve, a straight line between two goods. You can produce it from one uh, factor, which is labor. So you have, let's say, 500 laborers working in an economy where they can produce two goods. The combination or the mix of labor could produce either one, then you specialize, or the other, then you specialize, or a mix of the two. And this mix of the two will be shown after the break. And the break is sponsored by Norwegian install, which is the water. But you get it freer or cheaper by using the tap. If you wonder why they sponsor this lecture, it's simply because it's a very profitable business. And that is because incoming Italian students think it's not good to drink tap water in Norway. But that bottle could be tapped from the tap water. So what you pay for is the plastic. The taste is the same. OK. You have it in a bottle. You could have it in a glass. That's different. OK. So production possibilities indicates what you can produce of the labor given. Remember one thing, budget constraint. You cannot produce whatever you want to. Two, this production possibilities indicate the opportunity cost. So if you reduce the production of one, you increase the production of the other, depending on the opportunity cost. And three, it's a question of relative prices with a C, not an S. So this is not your Grammy award or your Oscar award. This is not that price. Prices simply means price of one compared to the other good that you import, relative. So you compare the two of them. OK? And if you want to know something about relative prices, it is one, buying a drink in the bar, let's call it beer, compared to drinking tap waters. And the relative price of that is infin <coughs> infinitesimal, simply because tap water is free. So both prices has to be more than zero, a value higher than zero. Else it's not. So that is why the Italian buys the Norwegian tap bottle, so it gets a price and can discuss it in a model like this. Yes, a beautiful design. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like this design. Okay. But this gives you 
the, let's say, the basic elements of an analysis. You have a production possibility curve, you have relative prices, and you have an opportunity cost. And that is what Ricardo is all about. Three things, and Lena will mention it to it on the bus, production possibilities, opportunity cost, and relative prices. We will spend an hour with Ricardo from 4.15. No, it's not an hour. It's a lecture hour, which is 45 minutes in Norway. We don't know, uh, we are not very good at watches. So meet you here, 4.15 exactly.